Good morning. Good morning, uh, dear heritage lovers. It's a pleasure to speak to you from Brussels. Uh, but I would like to start by greeting the president um, of your organization, Mrs. Bahamonte. Of course, very warm greetings to Lilian, Jordi, and uh, all the colleagues. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be with you um, this morning, and I'm addressing you from Brussels on behalf of the European Commission, because indeed sustainability is a concern. So we try. Uh, sharing this moment with you. I would like also to say before touching uh, more deeply, um, uh, delving more deeply into the topic of today's exchange, I would like to thank your organizations the future for religious heritage, because they are an extremely engaged and supportive interlocutor for a number of years now. They are a member, as you know, of the expert group on cultural heritage that I'm chairing here in Brussels. Uh, they've been extremely active. You have been extremely active during the European Year of Cultural Heritage. So um, it's a pleasure to have you on board. And I would like to extend very special thanks to Lilian Krosfagers, who is a great leader, as I'm sure you know, very dynamic and extremely committed, always full of ideas. So now let's turn to um, the topic of today. You will be discussing and reflecting upon sustainability. And certainly this topic, this challenge, and also this ambition has been on our minds for a while now, especially during the crisis that we've been experiences over the past three years. Let's just remind what those crises were. Well, we had the pandemic, of course, and the consequences of the pandemic will stay for us for quite some time still. We've seen how much the cultural and creative sectors, also the cultural heritage sectors has suffered and it will require a continued, concerted, and targeted effort uh, to continue helping cultural heritage and the cultural sector on its path to recovery and long-term and sustainable measures that can strengthen it for good. We are also witnessing the tragic war happening not far away from us, uh, the destruction of Ukraine's cultural heritage we hear that it's more than 250 sites now, and many of them religious, that have been damaged by uh, this war of aggression. So these events have proven that we have to come together at different policy levels and among different disciplines to reflect on sustainability. Sustainability has different dimensions. It is economic, ecological, of course, social, cultural, but also spiritual sustainability that we need to think about. We know that the cultural and creative sectors contribute enormously to the European economy, but it's not, it's not, uh, the contribution of culture, of course, doesn't stop there. Culture is a driver for sustainability. Culture can help us become aware of issues, change our behavior. And it's even so much more powerful that it has an emotional and a um, spiritual dimension. Culture can give hope and a sense of meaning and resilience to the society. While the society is the one creating culture, helping it stay alive and thrive and be passed on to future generation. It's Bertolt Brecht who said, art is not a mirror to reflect reality, but a hammer to shape it, a hammer to shape it. So it's thanks to cultural and creative sectors, thanks to culture, thanks to cultural heritage, that we can have a leverage to shape our world and our future. Let us now pose and uh, uh, have a look at what the EU has been doing to try and support this path towards environmental sustainability. 
Well, you know that we have put in place the Green Deal, which is an ambitious set of laws, legislative acts, measures to bring our um, continent um, in shape to fight climate change and diminish CO2 emissions and decarbonize our economy. But I'm not going now to delve into those uh, details. What I want to um, discuss and highlight is how when it comes to culture and when it comes to cultural heritage, the EU and the European Commission is acting. <clears throat> so let us look at how we work with um, the countries, EU member states. We have, as European Commission, a constant dialogue on policies with uh, the ministries of culture uh, in the EU member states. And the way we shape our work is by agreeing work plans. So at the moment, we have an EU work plan for culture that covers the years 2023 until 2026. So we have four years to act and we have four priorities that we agreed upon. One of them, one of those four priorities is culture for the planet. In this context, we have discussed, for example, the issue of the energy crisis and how to make sure that um, energy efficiency requirements that all buildings have to fulfill in uh, Europe respect the specificities of protected buildings, including, of course, cultural heritage buildings, including heritage of um, religions. Now, I would like to give you two other concrete examples of our work, two milestones of the preceding work plan for culture. We had two very successful expert groups, again, gathering representatives of ministries of culture, and in one case, working together with re representatives of the ministries of environment. And those expert groups reflected on one hand on the cultural dimension of sustainable development, and they brought together um, a report with a number with 11 key recommendations. The report is called Stormy Times, Time to Act, and I do recommend uh, uh, this reading. The other report and the other expert group was about the relationship between climate change and cultural heritage. I believe that this report, the result of this work, on strengthening cultural heritage resilience for climate change will be presented to you by my dear colleague Anne Grazy, who steered the work of this expert group from the Commission side and who I see is sitting on the one of the first rows today in, in this room. So I'm delighted that she's with you to share the learning of this uh, expert group, which was one of the most interesting and one of the most useful um, of those past years. So she will give you all the details and all the figures and all the examples. What I'd like to highlight, and I'm sure she will say that as well, is that this report has been widely disseminated. So the result of this expert group, expert exchanges, and it even made it to the US. Um, uh, it found uh, quite some uh, interest there because it turns out that Europe is a bit ahead when it comes to connecting those um, connecting those objectives of one hand fighting climate change, where cultural heritage has a lot of lessons to give, how you know some ancient techniques can be really useful and um, full of lessons for the challenges of today, but also how in the face of the climate change and its uh, tremendous, potentially very harmful consequences, how cultural heritage has to be protected starting from now. And um, that was the first time at European level that such topics were discussed in depth by policymakers. We understood that many countries in Europe are still lagging behind when it comes to sufficiently adapting their conservation and preservation plans um, uh, of cultural heritage, the preservation of cultural heritage buildings to uh, the impact of uh, climate change. So 
this expert group was extremely uh, useful. It also looked at how to preserve intangible cultural heritage, and it's particularly important um, for an audience like yours, uh, because you are very uh, concerned and attached not only to buildings, but of course to uh, the spirituality that um, they allow and they host. Let me give you another example of our action. It's the new European Bauhaus. With the new European Bauhaus, the president of the commission, Mrs. von der Leyen, wants to give a human face to the Green Deal, a human face to this set of legislation which is needed in order to prepare to the consequences of climate change and uh, try to um, lessen uh, the impact that our economy has on, on climate. The Green Deal is about changing the way the industry works, changing the way we consume, but it's a lot about legislation and we need to also have a different way in which we approach the way we build buildings, the way we live in our cities. That's why the new European Bauhaus was uh, put together to reflect on the aesthetics the sustainability, but also the inclusivity of our buildings, cities, and countries. So the new European Bauhaus is again, you know, I mean, this new movement is again one of the um, uh, is also one of the ways in which we are trying to contribute to sustainability. Let me now turn to what's happening in Ukraine. Um, because as we said in the beginning, it's one of the very terrible events that is happening at our doors, at our frontier, but it's also about cultural and spiritual sustainability. So we are doing our utmost in helping Ukraine cope with the destruction it is faced with. We have a flagship program called Creative Europe, and we recently published a 5 million euro call for projects to support the Ukrainian cultural and creative sectors. We also are going to work with ICRAM, a specialized cultural heritage body, to train cultural heritage professionals in Ukraine and improve their skills when it comes to risk management, emergency risk management for cultural heritage. We have also supported ALIF, which is an organization that provides emergency cultural heritage, uh, emergency protection for cultural heritage in the very first uh, months of uh, the war. And finally, we will soon set up, I mean, soon have a meeting of a new expert group, which I will be chairing, which will be reflecting on how to further safeguard the cultural heritage of Ukraine and how, when it comes to you know, the future recovery, sometimes reconstruction, that should be done in the most skillful ways, learning from experiences in the past and learning from the very best practices that are available in Europe, but also in the world. Now, before concluding, I would like to mention another emerging topic that we in the Commission will be concentrating on, and that is the relationship between culture and well-being. And well-being, as you know, as we know all, is physical but also spiritual. And um, culture and spiritually meets, and religion is often the way that makes that meeting happen. So uh, religious architecture and objects are not only a symbol of faith, but also intangible heritage. Beliefs, rituals, and knowledge are passed on through generations, and that's where your organization and its objectives um, come into place and play such an important role. To finish, let me go back to the words pronounced by the co-founder of a Ukrainian NGO called uh, who started the world Vishivanka Day, and Vishivanka is a traditional Ukrainian um, blues. During the last uh, ceremony for the 
European Union and the Europa Nostra Award Ceremony for Cultural Heritage, this lady who got awarded the prize said, we must protect cultural heritage, but cultural, cultural heritage also protects us. It is a spiritual arms of Ukrainian people. So I would like to propose that we are inspired by this sentence, this sentiment, and uh, that is reminds in our heads as our life in peaceful Europe so far goes on, but also as you go ahead during your reflections uh, today uh, on sustainability. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you um, an excellent day. I know your event is going very well, and uh, I wish I could be with you in Lund. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much everybody for inviting me to discuss this important topic at such an important gathering. As a Muslim, I have to confess, I nearly didn't make it this morning, because of course, today is Eid. And um, for my own spiritual well-being, I rushed out of Lunt in search of a mosque, found it on the very edge, got a taxi there, which was fine. And then when I got there, on my return, I realized there are no taxis out that way. So after a brief panic, I found a bus that brought me back to the front of the cathedral. So panic over, spiritual well-being intact. Um, we're going to move on now. <laughs> and you'll soon find that what happened this morning is actually very symptomatic of the arenas I engage with. And I do so in the hope that going forward, these things begin to change, of course. Some of you may already know that I wear a number of hats, as you can see from the title slide. This isn't me showing off. This is so that I can take you through these particular hats, focusing on minority heritage. And um, more specifically, Muslim heritage. Because of course, although Muslim heritage isn't a minority heritage everywhere, I engage with it in the spaces where it is. So what does that mean? Well, minority heritage for me is the heritage in any given space that is often overlooked or simply ignored in favor of what we might term the authorized or popular heritage, which tends to then, of course, dictate how a space is viewed. This is why I often focus my work across Europe, where Islam, in spite of its length, 14 centuries of presence and immense contribution to Europe's cultural landscape is still completely ignored and overlooked when discussing the continent's religious heritage. We often hear the claim that Europe's religious heritage is Judeo-Christian or pagan. The first one I find quite problematic, a term which I'll come back to later in my talk. As you will see though, I don't, however, restrict myself to Europe and also engage with this heritage in other spaces where it is marginalized. So over the course of the next 20 or 25 minutes, I think I've still got, I will show you how I do this wearing each of those hats to foster social sustainability. Before honing in on one particular example that has caught the imagination of many of my colleagues in here to demonstrate this in greater depth. I begin with the work I do for travel guides. Um, I'm an author for Lonely Planet. Many of you are no doubt have carried around those blue dogged books when you've ventured off to far off distant places. When you read that stuff and it's all wrong, I'm the kind of person you blame. <laughs> I am one of the Lonely Planet's only Muslim authors and Islamic heritage experts. And one of the guidebooks where I felt this expertise and knowledge could be particularly useful. Actually, it wasn't the only one, there were several, but we won't go there right now, um, was Thailand. I made the point to the editor of the Thai book that Thai Muslims are generally represented very, very negatively in the book, if at all. Um, the only segments that covered Thai Muslim culture tended to focus entirely on the insurgency and the terrorist activities that apparently take place. There was nothing else 
about Thai Muslim culture within this book. In fact, when I spoke to most people that had ventured to Thailand, they didn't even know it had a Thai Muslim culture. Yet Islam is the second largest religion in the country. So I pointed out to my editor that my own research, my own travels had revealed to me a wonderfully, fantastically exciting culture, a warm, embracing culture, one that I felt very much at home at as a Southeast Asian myself, and uh, sorry, as a South Asian myself in amongst Southeast Asians, and I wanted to redress this. So they sent me to the South. And based on my own research and studies, and along with the help of several local um, friends that I made along the way, I ended up in particular focusing on this area in the region of Songkla, where for the purposes of this particular presentation, I'll show you how I focused on a forgotten figure called Sultan Suleiman Shah, a 17th century ruler of what was then known as the Sultanate of Singora. His was a, this is, this is an artist impression. We have no idea what he looked like, but you know how these things work. He was a flourishing, his was a flourishing, prosperous city-state and an international trading hub for European merchants. It briefly withstood the might of the ancient Thai kingdom of Ayutthaya in the north. His descendants influenced many aspects of modern Thai culture, with one of them actually giving birth to Thai King Rama II. I engaged the local community, several academic and activist friends of mine, and they helped me unearth, well, not unearth, but basically reveal to myself at least, many of the ruins scattered across the former Sultanate area. Mostly ancient forts like this, sometimes as well-preserved as this one. Some even had these wonderfully well-preserved cannons in them. And um, the most exciting discovery, however, was the Sultan's original tomb which lay in a neglected cemetery near a petroleum plantation. What was interesting is that the local Muslims and even some of the Buddhists still revered the Sultan. They were really proud of his story. They had even built a mosque named after him. They carried out worship at the site and firmly believed in a historic Muslim Thailand. But none of this appeared in the popular or authorized national narrative. As far as they were concerned, everyone was Buddhist and Muslims were troublesome insurgents. When I did end up developing a walking trail around these sites, as far as I'm aware, it was the first time the Sultan's narrative and the ruins appeared in any popular travel and tourism literature. In developing the walking tours and points of interest that tourists would follow in one of the most famous, sorry, on one of the most famous travel platforms in Lonely Planet, with the help of the local community, three major aspects of social sustainability were achieved here. Placemaking. It validated the local Muslims' idea of a Muslim Thailand. Capacity building. The Thai Muslims felt more visible and that there was a positive narrative finally being put forward about them. And of course, community participation. The trails are used informally by many of the friends that I've mentioned who took part in developing them. And now to my journalism, and we fly across the world, being a travel writer, this is what I tend to do, to Washington DC, where my second example shows you how I use my journalism to do similar work. Of course, in the US, post 9-11, the popular image of Muslims became dangerously problematic. And through this article, you can see I tried to reveal some of the US capital's hidden Islamic heritage. For example, I explain how the Library of Congress, built on the eve of the 19th century, has a painted dome, very Renaissance-like, with Islam written on it. It acknowledges the religion as one of the great civilizations. So on the dome, we have Islam. Most people go into this Library of Congress and they have no idea that it's sitting there, along with several other great civilizations that apparently modern America was built upon. I also discuss, when Geordie gets things sorted, you will see a picture of it, the famous Quran 
of US founding father Thomas Jefferson, who reportedly used it to establish many of the legal rights upon which the new free world was founded. And finally, finally, a little known American Islamic Heritage Museum, which I consciously chose because it was not in museum district, but in an unfashionable neighborhood south of the river and is the life's work of a black local man who looking into his roots, as many black Americans have done, discovered he was descended from Muslim slaves and then went about building an entire archive of America's Muslim heritage based on his own research, his own travels. It's an absolutely fascinating space, very poorly funded and entirely neglected by the mainstream tourists. The only ones who turn up there are really nerdy, geeky people like me. The piece, again, offers education because, of course, those that read it would have been educated on the fact that Islam has played quite the role in the construction of modern America, even if modern America itself doesn't seem to be aware of this. Of course, capacity building again, you can see that with the impact of the gentleman there. And of course, the many, many Muslim Americans, some of whom are close friends of mine, who suffered immensely in the post 9-11 fallout. Many of them actually left the country because it was unbearable. And of course, again, community participation. Most of this work, I have absolutely no hope of achieving without engaging with the local community. And next, I take you back to Europe, where my most recent book, um, which Jenny very kindly introduced in that fabulous way, thank you, Minarets in the Mountains, it's not a guidebook, it's a narrative, is about a journey I took with my family through the Western Balkans, a region that I term Muslim Europe. And it was, of course, historically Muslim Europe, for those of us that know. For at least six centuries, it was Muslim Europe. And then if we look to the south, that region was Muslim Europe for over nine centuries. So Muslim Europe isn't an imagined thing. It's a very real thing. And in this particular region, you could argue that's the case even today. Three of the six countries we traveled through are quote unquote Muslim countries from a population demographic. Bosnia and Herzegovina, Albania and Kosovo are all Muslim majority countries. Yet if you were to tell somebody that Europe has Muslim countries, it sounds like an oxymoron. And this is what I tried to address in this book. I tried to highlight the depth of Europe's indigenous Muslim culture in this region. And some of the highlights that I pull out in the book include important European Muslims almost entirely overlooked in the authorized popular narrative, such as Sultan Murad I, the Ottoman Sultan who's buried just outside Pristina in Kosovo. It was Sultan Murad and the Ottomans alongside several um, lowly Serbian princes and other individuals that of course went head to head with Prince Lazar in that fabled war that led to the Ottomans arriving in Europe proper. A hugely significant moment in Europe's history, but almost entirely looked passed over when we discuss European history. Um, the next thing that's gonna pop up is an indication of Europe's vast and fascinating Islamic scholarship, which isn't just neglected by non-Muslims, sadly, it's neglected by Muslims as well. And um, the picture there shows um, a gentleman in a nondescript town, Zanitsha, in Bosnia, holding a very rare book on Islamic fiqh called Majmul Bahrain, the meeting of the two seas, and the two seas being Shafi and Hanafi fiqh, in one book. The book is older than Sarajevo, and it's just sitting there on this library. No gloves involved, no glass cases. And for me, it was a tragedy, of course, to see this in a place where it's been potentially, I mean, it wasn't a tragedy that they have this. It was just a tragedy that these things are scattered across these areas. Some have been lost and um, very few people take much notice of them. Finally, 
for the purposes of this conversation, the, pl the thing that I wish to point out was, of course, Europe's Muslim Jewish heritage. And I've put up a Sephardic um, synagogue in Nish for this example because it was here that I had a very emotional moment when it dawned on me that my education on Europe's Jewish history is entirely dark. I'm told that everything that happened to the Jews in Europe is negative and horrific. And of course, we know that is largely the case. But then when I looked at my European Muslim Jewish history, I found a very different story. I found a community that flourished, was protected and given sanctuary for almost 12 centuries. And yet it's not a part of my mainstream understanding of European history, which I think is an absolute travesty, given the impact it could have today to change Muslim Jewish relations. And this is why I have a problem with this Judeo-Christian term. It suggests some kind of cozy alliance. It's never been a cozy alliance. I think the computer's screwed. Um, <laughs> it's never been a cozy alliance. It's been far from a cozy alliance between Judaism and Christianity. And I'm not here to bash Christians or Christianity, but just to point out that when we look at the darker European history, it's a Judeo-Christian dark history. The Muslim Jewish history is one that is luminous. Almost without fail. And that was one of the great travesties for me on this journey, to realize that so much of my history, especially something so beautiful, is wildly neglected. And this is the impact it had. I'm going to use just a couple of quotes just to mix it up from the last time. And you can see, in terms of placemaking and capacity building, the crime novelist, British crime novelist, Kia Abdullah said, if I had read Minarets in the Mountains in my youth, I would have almost certainly felt differently about my religion. Maybe she wouldn't have felt so ashamed the way I did. Maybe she wouldn't have felt so unwanted, alienated, lacking anchorage, the way I did. She's also a British Bangladeshi that was born in and around the area of Brick Lane in East London, like me. And then from an education perspective, I've put a very obvious one, where Professor Sunny Singh of London Metropolitan University has stated she's delighted to add minarets to her non-fiction writing syllabus. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take you finally, if I have the time, um, to the project which I'm going to speak about in a little bit more depth. This is part of what you might call my grassroots heritage activism. And it's centered around Britain's first purpose-built mosque, the Shah Jahan in Woking, Surrey. In fact, it's Northwestern Europe's first purpose-built mosque. A place so important to European Muslims that during the early part of the 20th century, it was dubbed the Mecca of Europe. This was part of a bigger project where several milestones took place. We installed two blue plaques, one to acknowledge the country's first purpose-built mosque on the mosque itself, and another for Britain's very first Muslim cemetery. On the right, we have Wilhelm Gottlieb Leitner, dressed up as a Muslim, who founded both the cemetery and the mosque as part of his Oriental College project. And then on the left, we have the Begum Shah Jahan, who helped to fund it. We also um, brought back and did a revival edition of the Islamic Review, which was Britain's longest running Muslim magazine coming out of the Woking Mosque. And there you see Lord Headley, one of the first um, aristocrats, British aristocrats to convert to Islam, and his mentor Khawaja Kamaluddin, and they founded the magazine. But most excitingly, we developed Britain's very first Muslim heritage trails two self-guided trails between three sites and a cemetery walk. The first we call Britain's Muslim Heritage Trail number one, the Woking Trail, <coughs> and it takes you between the three key sites. You have the only grade one listed mosque in the country, the Shah Jahan, and next to it the Sir Salah Jung Memorial House, which Leitner used to use as his library, gallery and museum. And then we have this is a space I haven't introduced to you, now known as the Peace Gardens, but originally the Woking Muslim War Cemetery, where the Muslims that fought and died for Britain were eventually buried after much criticism from the enemy. Um, 
They were buried in this stunning space which fell into disrepair and very, very recently on the centenary of the Great War, um, it was refurbished. The bodies had been moved out quite a while ago and is now a space to enjoy. And finally, of course, what is now known as the Muslim burial ground, but when it was founded by Leitner, it was the Mohammedan Cemetery in 1884. The second trail, very different, is a walking trail, um, which takes you around the ancient cemetery um, and takes you to the graves of a host of individuals that are so significant to the Western Muslim narrative and are almost entirely unknown by the vast majority of people. That includes Abdullah Kulliam, who was an actual Sheikh al-Islam of Britain. In other words, he was conferred with this title by the Ottoman Empire, a convert to Islam. He also founded the first mosque, Lord Headley, who I've mentioned, <clears throat> convert and great champion. The great English translator of the Quran, Muhammad Marmaduke Pictou, um, probably the most influential Quran translator in English in history. One of the last Ottoman princesses, the former Sultan of Oman, the murdered um, Palestinian cartoonist and father of Handala, Naji Ali, the Sufi Idris Shah, award-winning um, architect Dame Zaha Hadid, and most amazingly, a discovery I made long before I began this project, an actual British descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Princess Muzba Haider, daughter of the ex-Grand Sharif of Mecca, Amir Ali Haider of the Devi Zaids, for those of you that know that kind of lineage. So, how did these trails impact social sustainability. I have no idea how much time I've got left, but I'm just gonna keep going until somebody tells me to shut up. Okay, so in terms of placemaking, these trails have helped to create Muslim Britain. Now, if you don't already know, Islam in Britain goes way before these trails. What you're looking at behind me is an eighth century gold coin minted by an Anglo-Saxon king known as King Offa of Mercia. In the middle, in Latin, I have three minutes. In the middle, in Latin, it says offer rex. But around the edge, it has in Arabic, very crude Arabic, the Shahada of Islam. Now, why is one of the very first kings of England minting a gold coin that has the Shahada of Islam on it? It's a mystery many have tried to solve. And on the back, it pays homage to the Khalif Harun al-Rashid, I think, if I remember off the top of my head. Um, in Baghdad. So Muslim Britain is nothing new. Of course, the other place making it does is it creates and puts on the map in a very firm way the mosque and more importantly, because the mosque, although um, listed as grade one, the cemetery is completely overlooked and you can see written there, Mohammedan Cemetery reserved by the Oriental Institute, Institute Woking. And it tries to push this in to the authorised narratives. I've since also implemented an entire chapter called Muslim Britain into the new Lonely Planet Guide, so to try and push it into that popular format. In terms of capacity building, it makes us much more visible, especially these Muslim soldiers. Until that centenary, most people had ignored the fact that almost three million fought for Britain. Three million from the subcontinent, not all entirely Muslim. Um, and many, many died. Only a handful were buried here. Many died, obviously, on the fields. Um, it also allows us to feel like we belong. This is a photo of the earliest Muslims praying outside, it's not praying, sorry, outside the mosque in Woking. People we knew nothing about until this history was being looked into. Um, of course, it offers education. This is um, the Oxford University's Faculty of History, who arrived, um, had a wander around, and were very, very honest to tell us that they felt it had the capacity to help decolonize British cultural narratives, which was a very powerful statement, one we've used in order to try and champion our work. And we've actually, I, I realize the slides are all over the place, the, the notes are not going with the images, I do apologize. Um, and we've actually also developed um, secondary school resources connected to the actual trails, and they're the first, very first secondary school resources ever created on Britain's own Muslim history. In terms of stakeholders, from the off, we engaged 
with the local community. The Shah Jahan Mosque is a functioning mosque. There is the mosque manager on the right. There are some of the community members. Um, they were involved from the off. Many of them were our volunteers. Many were advisors. Um, many were actively employed as part of it. We also engaged with non-Muslim local stakeholders, such as the Surrey History Centre, the Lightbox, mo um, the mosque and the Brookwood Cemetery, all of whom inherited the trails as their very own and now run those trails. They're self-guided trails. You just have to pick up the map. They don't have to do anything. That was the point of the trails. So that our exit strategy meant there was not much work to be done in order to sustain them. In terms of community participation, we had curators and creators, all from the Muslim Grassroots Project Everyday Muslim, who I was employed by in order to deliver this. And we had um, interviewees. Many of our interviewees were from the local community. As I said, many of the um, volunteers, local historians. And now some of them have even become guides. Even though it's self-guided, as you can imagine, many people would, do appreciate having an informed guide take them around. And um, we've got at least three locals who now pride themselves on being the very first guides to Britain's Muslim heritage trails. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So I stay here. And now we have some room for some questions and I think Ruth over the back there had her hand up. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for your very inspiring and also think very important uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, asking for a friend. I have a colleague. Um, he's an engineer. He has been a high school teacher. Um, he's a writer, journalist, um, and he's also a Muslim. And now he's doing a PhD. Mm -hmm. In his own time, he has established a uh, Muslim archive Wonderful. in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, we have that live 17 million people, and we almost have 1 million Muslims by now. But there is no archive whatsoever. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he recently talked to him, and I said, how is it going? He said, well, not much, because there is no infrastructure for us. We have yeah. no idea what to do. Yes. Um, so we made the initiative. He should even gain some media attention. But now there's nothing going on, because mm -hmm. They get no help, no funding. Yeah. Uh, what would you say that that can be done here or, or in Europe to support these kind of local initiatives? F firstly, what country is that? The Netherlands. The Netherlands. Oh, interesting. Are you talking about the Muslim archive, archive yes. in 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 the Netherlands in in Amsterdam? Yeah. Okay, so I'm already working with them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm already working with them, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him directly. Um, Lorraine, you remember he came onto our meeting online? Yes, yeah, so I'm aware. And one of the things I've already suggested to them, if it becomes absolutely um, critical and they're unable to access funds, um, one of the only places in Europe, as far as I'm aware, that has an actual dedicated um, professional strong room is the East London Mosque in, in the UK, which um, opened a, uh, an archive room uh, completely, you know, climate controlled and all the other elements that you need to have in these special places and they do open invitations for mosques from around the UK to um, submit their archives because most mosques do not have this culture. It's a, it's a learning process for us as well as a community of course and um, so I will be speaking um, to your friend and, and saying to him I could potentially talk to the East London Mosque if they would temporarily hold this because they have the space. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, sorry, I absolutely love thank what you. you do, and I love your presentation, and we've talked, of course, but every time I've heard you talk, and especially now, it's almost as if you're describing what I did about right. Jewish yeah. heritage and culture in <laughs> Eastern and Central Europe 34, I mean, more than 30 years ago, when nothing was known, Absolutely. it was considered a vacant space. There were no archives, there were no inventories, no trails, no nothing. And I was putting things on the map with my first book, Jewish Heritage Travel, A Guide to Eastern and Central Europe, which came out in 1992. So I offer you some 
you know, looking <clears throat> back at everything that's happened regarding Jewish heritage and Jewish tourism and Jewish travel and Jewish archives and Jewish studies and all of this over the past 30 some years. Absolutely. I only hope that it takes less time, less time and things go faster for the Muslim heritage, which I think now, given the circumstances we have now, because when I was doing, there was no internet or anything like that, but looking toward the future, I think what you're doing is just laying this groundwork for incredible work and more people and more visibility and more research and more travel and everything. And I just hope it takes less time than it's taken for the, although the Jewish heritage stuff took off within the past few years, but really now there's such a surfeit. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's like this deja vu, which I'm listening Absolutely. to, but it's, it's just, it's just wonderful what you're doing. And I Thank you, Ruth. And um, I'm, I'm being known to you after we first met, um, I often quote you when I'm speaking in conversations and I will point out that, you know, um, I've actually met colleagues who feel like I am where they were 30, 40 years ago um, when they were addressing Jewish heritage, which was, um, if it, at best, it was just dark heritage. Apparently nothing positive, nothing good. There were no scholars, there was no poetry, there was no music, none of this stuff. And of course, people like yourself, Ruth, Michael here, are doing an amazing job of changing that and you are definitely great inspirations for people like myself. And where I can, of course, I try to connect you with those individuals. And I often use that quote that you said to me all the way back in Groningen all those years ago when we met, um, that I'm just where you were 40 years ago. I just hope I lived that long as well, because <laughs> I didn't start early enough. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Do we have any other questions? Uh, hi, really great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, 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 I was just reflecting on how what you're doing translates into um, Muslim communities across England, particularly because that's my sphere of interest, really. And whether um, there's a general interest to curate more recent history of, of communities coming in. So, say, I was working in Bolton where there had been a a big influx of a very specific Muslim community in a very small area. The dry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and the, the story is fascinating. When you walk the streets, it's like a heritage trail. It's like, this is where we set up our first Absolutely. mosque. It's just a terraced house. Mm -hmm. And now it's still a terraced house. But there's nothing there that indicates, because they've built some fabulous mosques since. And I just wondered whether there was kind of an, an idea that, that some communities might be curating their own story, yeah. really, or it's just left and then people will come back to it later. So the Everyday Muslim um, project that I work with, they also work with the more recent history as well. Um, and one of the things they do is they will collect oral histories, they will campaign for blue plaques to have certain spaces recognized, and they will have those um, oral histories um, submitted to the National Archives. So we have a growing body. Then you've also got people like Shahid Salim, who's a great architect, British Muslim architect, recently did an installation in the Royal Albert, um, sorry, Victorian Albert, Museum. Um, Shahid has written one of the, uh, an amazing book which documents the history of the British mosque and of course that addresses mostly those that came about in the post-colonial period. So there's definitely people working in that arena. It just so happens that my fascination and my area of interest goes a little bit further back and I really wanted to um, address this particular history because I think it's criminal that this particular history isn't known more widely across Europe because these three places are not just significant to Britain. They are the first across Northwestern Europe as far as we're aware. So it's everybody's history, especially in that part of Europe that considers itself Europe proper because it often ignores everything East. So, you know, if we were to not ignore everything East, then of course we would have here a room full of Muslims who are talking about the Ottoman mosques in decay, the Ottoman baths that are in decay, and the non-Ottoman spaces as well, like the Bektashi lodges, and, and I could go on. Yeah. Lorraine, I think. Lillian? Lillian, sorry, Lillian. No, no, it's your question. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Tari, for, for, for being here and coming to us, because I, I have the following question. I think also understanding each other and getting to know each other is the basic of peace. And uh, so I, I also do think, as Catherine Magnan addressed also in, in the EU very much, this new European Bauhaus, this resilient society for the future, 
it's so important, this intercultural, interreligious yes. dialogue, and it starts with understanding. And so, <clears throat> I, I, my question is, you said, or at least the, the person from the Netherlands said, um, it is always very hard for us, also as average, but you see the network works finally, to find people from the Muslim community or the Muslim or understanding the Muslim background to come to us. So therefore, it's a big uh, yes. achievement that you are here. Mm -hmm. But also, he said, and my question is, is there really a lack of structure? Because uh, I know also in the Netherlands we try to bring in many times the Muslim community, and it is very hard to have speakers. I think there are two things here that I want to highlight, and of course it's a very, very complex response in truth, you know, um, and, and I don't want to speak for the entire Muslim community in Britain, let alone Europe, you know, so I'm not pretending to speak for, the, um, for Muslims across the globe, but I would say you have to remember a couple of things. One, um, certainly in recent Muslim history, this is not a part of our culture, you know. Um, it's it, it, the, the concept of archiving the mosque's um, history and things like that. They're, they're all new things. So there's, there's a lot to learn for, for, from, from our community perspective. But the other thing, and I think the most important thing is, as is a very jaded community, it's experienced a lot of betrayal from outsiders of late. It, it, it is very, very suspicious still, you know. And, and that's why when you work with these people, you have to have gatekeepers. You have to have gatekeepers who can introduce you and there is no point in you trying to engage with this community or any other community and then get frustrated that they're not talking to you. That's not how it works. You, you have to go down or go up to their level. And, and, and I think what we found is, of course, when you have um, people in your team or certainly working closely with your team that are considered insiders, you know this from the academic insider, outsider you know, dichotomy, um, that helps massively. Um, but the gatekeepers are phenomenal. I'm, although I'm a Muslim and Everyday Muslim is a Muslim organization, we needed gatekeepers to access the Woking community properly because it was a very, very close. Because, of course, as with any religious group, we also have sectarianism. We also have suspicion amongst ourselves, as, as everybody does. And so it's very, very difficult for me to turn up and say, oh, you know, I'm just going to do a really nice academic job, guys, don't worry. You know, I'm going to tell the objective truth. I, mean, I don't even know what that is anymore. Um, and of course, they, they, they just look at me like, yeah, of course you are. We know you're from East London, Moss. You grew up here. And then, and then they start making all these assumptions and it gets very, very tricky. So there's no point. So, so what we do is we, we engage with gatekeepers that know our work, trust our work, and, and, then, and then we work through them. And, and we tell them that we will stop when they tell us to stop. We will start when they tell us to start. And we will only go so far. And we run everything by them. Trust is a big part of working with this community because of how much of it has been lost recently. My name's Tom, and my name's Lee, and we're from uh, we're ethnologists at Lynn University, and we're here to talk to you about a project we're working on right now called Life in the Church. Um, it's a project we've conducted with three other scholars, um, Zekra Dan, Henrik Lindblad, and Anna Valer. Actually, Life in the Church is a sub-project, which is uh, coming out of a larger uh, collaborative initiative, which is financed by the uh, Vice Chancellor's Office at Lund University. That's a project entitled Heritage on the Move in the Name of Democracy. Uh, the background to this was the 2015 events in which Sweden opened its doors to uh, refugees coming from Syria and Afghanistan. <coughs> Approximately 160,000 people, more than that, came here, almost all of them coming through the railway station in Malmö. Uh, as this happened, the museums in the region were immediately uh, on the ball, uh, collecting information, documenting what was happening, doing interviews, taking photographs, collecting material culture. Uh, and they had a, a real question as to what can we do with this type of material? Uh, what can we ethically do with it? How can we use it uh, to educate people? Uh, so they contacted us, and we started working on this together. Uh, as we were doing that, uh, people from the Church of Sweden contacted us and said, we have a problem also concerning heritage, and that is the heritage of the Church of Sweden. What can we do with it? And it was Henrik Lindblad who was there talking to us. Um, the problem is that here in Lund, the diocese, has over 550 churches and church buildings. I'm not actually sure what the final number is. Uh, but most of these places are closed either permanently or at least for parts of the year. They're not warmed up. Uh, there's limited amounts of electricity, uh, toilets, these types of things. The question is how could these buildings, how could these places 
be used in a more inclusive manner, uh, a more open manner and a more welcoming manner uh, for many small communities. Uh, that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, and I think one thing I'd like to emphasize here is this concept of heritage which we're all talking about. Uh, I have colleagues in archaeology who often assert, you know, as soon as we pull something out of the ground, this is a part of our heritage uh, automatically, or it's part of your heritage or someone else's heritage. But uh, from our own point, we don't see heritage in this way. Uh, when we're working on this project here with the, the uh, refugees, we're trying to think of how can we think of migration, mobility, uh, movement in the world as a form of heritage that people carry with them. Uh, thinking of heritage more in terms of a process. Uh, if we go back in time and look at the concept itself, back in uh, 1952, uh, UNESCO defined heritage as that which is imbued with a message from the past, the historic monuments of generations of people remain to, to the present day as living witnesses of their age-old traditions. So in this sense, heritage was monuments, buildings, material culture. Uh, sort of things that were out there. Uh, uh, but if we move forward to the 1970s, uh, we get a notion of sort of a natural heritage. All of a sudden, there are aspects of nature which we ascribe meaning to, which are meaningful to groups of people, which should be uh, considered in terms of heritage terms. And we move into the 1990s, and we were just talking about intangible cultural heritage. And this is when this type of uh, heritage is recognized more formally. Uh, this is things that people do. Uh, it's song, it's dance, it's music skills, traditional skills which we've had, thatching, working in ways with timbering. Uh, so the concept of heritage here is not static, but ever changing and developing. I think that's something we should bear in mind. Uh, heritage is, as we see in different posters here, there are uses of the past in the present for the means of shaping the future. And I think we have to think of how can we move heritage in new ways in different directions. Uh, heritage, when we think of it in this way, uh, requires investments. It doesn't just exist. It's not just pulled out of the ground. Uh, it requires investments culturally, uh, socially, as well as economically. And I think we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Lee now to talk a little about a few of the churches we've been looking at here uh, in Scania uh, and trying to think of what they could be. Yeah, so right now we're engaged with three churches in the region. Uh, the first here is Inyaberia Nuya Sherka, which was built in 1887 and has just been reopened and is used periodically for services as well as often for music conference or concerts that are organized by a local citizens committee. There's also a much older church on the same premises that is also used um, for services. The second church we're looking at is called Ustrin Nebelev. This is hoped to be a cultural church, but as you can probably see from these photos, there was a renovation project that got about halfway there. The exterior renovations were completed. You can see that on the left, but the funding did fall through for the interior renovations, and so the project stalled. There's a lot the church needs, like floors, restrooms, that sort of thing. Uh, we did, or there were enlisted uh, some architectural firms who came up with some suggestions for this interior space. You can see some of the visuals that they came up with here. And then in addition, we have three plans that they offered. That first one up top is a plan for a gallery space. On the bottom left is a plan for a concert space. And on the bottom right is a plan for a banquet space. And these plans actually correlate pretty well with our findings from conversations that we've had with local members of the community who have said, yes, there definitely is a need for concert spaces here. There's an interest in a year-round gallery space as well. And there's also a general interest for gathering spaces for young people and old people in particular. But these conversations have also emphasized that there is an awareness and understanding that the issue is money. It is very difficult to find actors who are willing and able to invest, and municipalities might need to get involved with that. The last church is actually here outside of Lund. It's uh, in a place called Oroslov. And this church is desacralized. So it has had two uh, lighting installations actually recently. You can see this exterior one in this picture, this big arrow. And then there's an interior one as well. If you see on the left, those little beams of light, there's an audio component to this installation. So as people walk around and your body interacts with the light, the soundscape changes. There are some complications that come from this though. Uh, this installation requires electricity to run, which means expenses. And it also is itself quite expensive, which means that the church right now has to stay locked. So there is an accessibility issue. 
meanwhile, there are no, let's talk a bit about the location is also a bit of a complication. Um, you can see the red circle there. Odos Love is a little far away from everything. Uh, there is a village over to the left, to the west of it, called Stongbi. And then to the south of Odos Love, there are plans for a science village that's on the outside of the city of Lund. And right now there are two research centers there. One is called Max 4 and it is pretty much operational. The other is called ESS, your relation spallation source. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the ESS is in the process of launching right now. And we have been sp speaking to people there who they have ideas for this church space. They say that the Science Village will need some kind of visitor center, for example. They are definitely interested in exhibition and performance spaces related to their research. There's also a need for housing because there are a lot of visiting scientists that will be coming to this area. There's even a need for dining options. There's a need for a lot of different things. And in Stoneby, that village, there is also a new church space that's recently opened that has a functioning cathedral. It has meeting spaces for children and families. It's got a courtyard, offices. It, it satisfies a lot of other community needs. So there is a possibility here. ESS and Max 4 have these ideas, but it's not quite as simple as just handing over the keys to them, of course. There needs to be some kind of intentional approach to collaboration between the Swedish church, perhaps Max 4 and ESS, perhaps other organizations and actors in the area, and this approach needs to address, among other things, really practical questions like how are the heating costs divided or shared? Who invests what and when? Um, and that connects to what Tom said about how in order to have a heritage, you do need to maintain and invest in it. It's not a static object. It's active and alive. So in the case of the Swedish church, we think there's an opportunity here for them to make some choices about who to collaborate with, what to invest, and what to invest in. And I think uh, one thing which are, is important to remember is that collaborations take time. Uh, you have to work together with other people. And I think here uh, we see in, in Lund a need for people to be uh, uh, working together. I don't think the Swedish Church or the Church of Sweden can do this on its own. It's about working together with private actors, such as the European the ESS, the European Spatial Source. Uh, about working municipal leaders, municipal po politicians, and coming up with a common plan uh, to invest together in projects. And I think that issue of togetherness is very important here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I thank the president and the scientific committee of Future for Religious Heritage for this opportunity. And today I am delighted to share with you an international project that I am coordinating in Lucca and will take place by May 16 in Lucca. This project involves also some scholars, ICOMOS PREREC members. This international project aims to share an history of religious diplomacy between the Orient and the Occident from the 16th century to the early 20th century. Specifically, the, this international project allows, allows us to open a new perspective on the, the interreligious dialogue between Japan and the Holy See. This history starts in the south of Japan, in Kyushu, Island, and in the middle of the 17th century when Francisco Javier arrives near Nagasaki and starts the path of Christian evangelization in Orient. There are many scholars studying around the world the history of Japan between the 17th century and 19th century when this land closed the dialogue with other countries from many reasons that now I cannot analyze in this presentation, but it is important to know this topic for understanding uh, the means uh, of this uh, cultural heritage. 
Uh, the last September, uh, with the, the Archivist post of Luca, Paolo Giulietti, we visited the, the prefecture of Nagasaki and uh, we met uh, many people, hidden Christian, that today enhance the value of Christianity in Japan. This heritage is defined by the cultural landscape and the natural landscape, and this included the immaterial and the material components. Here, uh, here we um, can see the sacred places of the Eden Christians at Irado, Island. Uh, here uh, we can visit uh, many sites where also today Christian families pray. Here you can see a Christian halter um, near um, Shintoism area. Analyzing the local cultural heritage, we have found many devotional objects of torto and many families during the prohibition period has preserved this heritage and above all, the Christian faith. In many private houses, we have found also a wooden tablet with the sacred image used during ceremonies of renunciation in the Edo period, uh, because from 1597, Christianism was abolished. At the Shisma no Yakata Museum uh, in Irado Island, many art and craft were preserved. Uh, here we can appreciate some ancient paintings on wood or on uh, canvas fabric and above all small porcelain sculpture named um, Maria Canon. Um, this sculpture uh, represents the image of Maria the model of Jesus, but in these cases, distinguished as a Badish um, sculpture. Uh, this solution is a typical of the culture of the Eden Christians in Japan. Also, the snow uh, lady uh, transmitted for uh, four generations in the Sotomo area at the Nagasaki Prefecture, Nishino Sonoji District, represent the Eden Christianity at the private altars in many houses. In this image, we can see an altar in a private house where in front we find the Buddhist symbols and behind there are the Christians reference. This is typical in the Indian Christian houses. Another important topic is the enhancement of the site where the Indian Christians today continue to pray. And this is an important cultural landscape in the south of Japan and today also a world heritage. In general, this cultural heritage from June 2018 was appointed in the list of cultural um, world heritage. And today, many projects are finalized to know and to diffuse this incredible history. This is the page of UNESCO about the hidden Christian site in Nagasaki region. This month, uh, with the Archbishop uh, Paolo Giulietti, we are uh, promoting an international project titled Thesaurum Fidei for sharing knowledge about the mission in the Orient, uh, above all, the martyrs of missionaries uh, who died for the faith. We are waiting for you in uh, Luca 
uh, this May, and uh, on our website, Diocesi Luca Tesarum Fidei, uh, you can find more information, the program of the International Congress, the contents of the exhibition, and a complete schedule with many events uh, until uh, the uh, end of May. Thank you very much for your attention and I wish you all the best in land um, in this important uh, Congress. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this opportunity to present here at this very valuable and timely conference. And uh, Catherine Mannion has already mentioned what I'm going to talk about. Um, Strengthening cultural heritage resilience for climate change. What does it mean? What's it about? And the report. But firstly, I'd like to just mention about the European Union's competency in relation to cultural heritage. Safeguarding and the conservation of heritage remains with the member states. So what does the EU do? It assists and complements the actions of the member states in preserving and promoting cultural heritage, develops policies and programs, and very importantly, it provides funding through uh, different projects, such as you heard about uh, Creative Europe, 2.44 billion for this uh, period, the European's Capitals of Culture, Horizon Europe, the new European Bauhaus, and a whole many of uh, different projects and programs. The open method of coordination, and this is a term that's bandied around a lot in the EU, the OMC. What does it mean? What is it? And basically, it's where member states appoint different experts and members to a working group. And as Katrine mentioned this morning, this particular working group looking at cultural heritage and climate change is under the last work programme for culture, 2019 to 2022. Here, 55 experts were appointed from 28 countries, 28 member states, uh, 25 member states, sorry, and three associated countries, Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland. I coordinated and led and steered the working group. I was very fortunate because the experts were extremely dedicated and enthusiastic. And we were led by Dr. Johanna Lesner from Germany, who was a wonderful chair. So the title of the group, Strengthening Cultural Heritage Resilience for Climate Change, it actually comes from a mandate that was uh, agreed and approved under the German presidency in 2020. But it's directly linked to the SDG 13, Take Urgent Action to Combat Climate Change and its Impacts. And of course, we're looking at heritage. The objectives of the group was to identify and exchange good practices, to talk, to exchange, to get ideas. I mean, 55 experts in the room, which incidentally, when I say in the room, we met once physically because it was during COVID times. Looking at the innovative measures for protection, and it includes both tangible and intangible. Look at the current and emerging threats of climate change and examine what we can learn from cultural heritage. It's so much to offer. What can we learn in addressing um, the impact of climate change in line with the European Green Deal's goals? The outcome, awareness raising, capacity building, and produce a set of recommendations. But this is not just at EU level. It's also for national, regional, and local level. One of the things we did is we conducted a survey amongst the 28 countries to find out what is the state of play. And this particular part, it's only part of the survey, looks at climate change in national policies. And of course we found that culture and heritage lies with one ministry, climate change lies with another ministry, or even in some cases, ministries. Nine countries had no legal framework for cultural heritage and climate change. Seven had some plans, and 15 had cultural heritage policies that mention climate change, and 12 have climate change policies that mention <coughs> cultural heritage. When it came to writing the report and to putting the report together, we deliberated a lot about what we should put on, on the actual cover. 
And this, as you can see, is a very unusual image. It's the Acropolis. You, don't, you rarely see it covered in snow. And this was taken in February 2020, and he thought it was very telling, and it, it actually communicated a really good message. Also in the report, what we did is we gathered 83 case studies from 25 countries. But many of those case studies relate to tangible cultural heritage and very few on intangible. In fact, I was thinking last night when we were at that wonderful performance in the church that one of the case studies is from Finland and it deals with the Sami community and um, reindeer husbandry. A third of those case studies are research projects. And the key points that we take from the case studies, cultural heritage is threatened by climate change, but it also offers solutions and inspiration. There's a role for research and innovation. Traditional buildings are sustainable and climate friendly, and of course, it's better to upgrade and repair than demolish and rebuild. And we really need to keep monitoring. I'm going to fly through these because I've just been told I have five minutes left. There are a number of the case studies relating to um, religious and heritage sites. And this one is Sweden and um, the church towns. And it's a very, very interesting one where um, a brochure has been produced with a checklist. And it's very easy for the local community to use that checklist. And it offers examples of what you can do if there's mould, frost, fungus damaging the surrounding houses. Norway, and this is all about environmental monitoring, in, and I'm going to try and pronounce this, mainly in Reras and Brigham, and medieval buildings, but it's not only knowledge for the medieval buildings, but it's also for all traditional buildings as well. Another example is Portugal, where it uses AI, and three different churches, and the use of AI 3D scanning and alpha numerical data is being used to develop an AI prototype to monitor the changes and potential changes in the structure of the buildings. Spain is looking at preventative conservation and they're bringing together knowledge and techniques on how we can look at artworks, but particularly they're looking at oil paintings on canvas. And they're also developing a digital platform for making preventative conservation decisions. Cyprus, Larnaca and Limassol districts. And they're looking at fires, what happens when there's a fire. And they're using um, satellite imagery to detect the exact location and the intensity of the fire so they can do something. They can actually put um, either try and save the cultural heritage, but they can move that very, very quickly. Ireland, of course I'm going to talk about Ireland. And this is an interesting priory in the southwest of Ireland, which is already damaged considerably from the roaring Atlantic uh, sea erosion. 1950s, there was a defence wall built, but that itself is also deteriorating. And we're using a digital drone survey to try and protect and to monitor and evaluate what's happening to the site. This site is also not only a tourist de destination, but it's also still an active use cemetery. <coughs> In Italy, and we all know about Italy, and this is probably one of the most famous cases of what's happening with climate change. And St. Mark's Basilica, often flooded. We see the images on TV. And what's happening is they're working with the, the state and local administrations in addressing the effects of climate change on the monument. And they're doing upgrading using new technology and also traditional methods. And also using INSAR satellite uh, imagery for the protection of the 90 bell towers in Venice. I just slotted this slide in because um, the art of dry stone walling, because this year is a European year of skills. And this, um, the dry stone walls are not only an attraction in themselves, but they're also part of the intangible heritage. And you can find dry stone walling all over, um, all over Europe, in France, Italy, um, Ireland, Scotland. And this is about training and education and passing those skills on to the next generation. So in summary, we know climate change threatens all forms of cultural heritage. But the data we have is mainly on immovable, on the immovable heritage. And there's a lack of qualitative data. There's very little on intangible. 
and the main threats are severe precipitation, floods and heat waves. The key messages, a cross-structural approach is important. We need a digital platform for the exchange of information. National and regional authorities can do more. And there's a need for data on the economic costs of the, for the adaptation and mitigation um, of cultural heritage. This is what's happening so far in the awareness raising, and Catherine Mannion has mentioned this already. And in particular, there's an interest from the US National Park Service. And Dr. Johanna Lesnar, our chair, was actually over there in December and uh, promoting the work of Europe. And there's also an interest from the British Museum. And I should also say this is the first time ever an OMC report was uh, presented to the European Parliament, and that was in October of last year. So to finish, why are we doing this? I mean, we've talked about culture, we've talked about identity, we've talked about the importance, but we're safeguarding it for future generations. And I think this is a really important quote. The greenest building is the one already built. So thank you. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to present the poster through this uh, five minutes presentation. Uh, I'll speak about uh, this preliminary assessment uh, of the religious heritage dynamics in southern Portugal. I'll focus on Alentejo region, that is actually south of Portugal. Uh, so this is the, the region. Uh, Alentejo means literally beyond Tagus River, that is the main river in Portugal. Um, I identified 131 former uh, monasteries and convents. Uh, what is interesting is that in the, um, in the middle part uh, of, the, of this region, so we have four sub-regions in Alentejo, the middle one, Alentejo Central, has um, the, the most of, this, of these monasteries. 53%, uh, uh, mostly due to, to, to the main city, that is Evora, that historically has been a very important city in Portugal. Um, about the foundation dates, uh, they have been uh, funded since 2014. Um, and about the dissolution date, they've been mostly dissolved in 1834, because in Portugal we had dissolution of religious orders. So the male communities were um, ma had mandatory to leave the monasteries, while the female ones uh, could stay until the death of the last nun. Uh, these are the 131 shapes of the monasteries. Uh, most of them belong to the mendicant orders, so it means that they are um, smaller in size, with the typical uh, Alentejo um, features. Uh, despite this one, that is a Carthusian one, that is mostly, uh, that is pretty, very bigger uh, compared to the other ones. Uh, in terms of legal protection, we know that a bit more than half of these monasteries has not protection, legal protection at all. Uh, a bit less than 50% uh, uh, has protection, both uh, with local or with national protection. In terms of ownership and conservation state, I needed to split uh, the monastery in two parts because after the dissolution of religious orders, they have been sold uh, and this, uh, this complex has been uh, disjuncted. Uh, so it has been sold to different owners. For this reason, we have uh, the church that is most, um, more than half of the churches, monastic churches belong to private owners, the dioceses, of course. Um, in, with regard to the monastic dependencies, more than 15% belong to private individual owners or uh, private firms. Um, in terms of conservation state, fortunately, uh, uh, less than 50% is in good uh, or reasonable st state. It could be better, of course, uh, but we can work on this as an opportunity and, and as a challenge to, to get better into this, uh, into this area. These are some of the examples that I uh, surveyed with the on-site uh, photographic survey campaigns. So we have ruins, uh, bad conservation states, uh, bad facades of uh, former monasteries. Uh, this is another one that is in, uh, located in um, Littoral uh, Alentejo. Uh, it, was a for it is a former comment, of course. This means no entrar, do not enter. And nowadays, um, at the former church, as you can see, is a, 
um, an abusive uh, residence, if we can tell it that in this in this way. And with regard to these current uses, uh, the charge, 50 of these case studies still maintain the religious um, functions. Um, most of them are unused at all. On the other end, just one monastery still maintained the original functions. We have assistential uh, educative functions, but also five stars hotels. Uh, beautiful exhibitions in one of the former uh, church, this is of Yves Saint Laurent. Um, and other kind of uh, typologies that we can probably talk after a year uh, during the poster presentations. Um, mo some of these are uh, exposed in this um, Instagram page. I'm not an influencer at all, but I'm beginning to, to introduce some of these surveys into this Instagram page. Uh, I think it's important to disseminate it to, and to divulgate this cultural heritage in south of Portugal. But it com contains also northern uh, state uh, case studies, but also broader in Europe and all, all around Europe. Um, linked to this page, we have also this, this event in October that is, uh, co uh, that is, coordinate, that is um, organized also within the FRH as a, um, a support partner of this conference. So please uh, keep this in mind, and I hope you to see you all in uh, in Portugal in October. Tak, I think this is the right name. <laughs>
the private private owners that you spoke about, if any, <laughs> uh, or is just uh, as we uh, very much know, a research that comes to uh, from the academic world and just lays down there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. For <coughs> um, uh, uh, we have very different situations. Um, so it has not. It was possible to collect this data. Uh, then I can explain probably a bit more during presentation posters. Um, it has been possible just through, uh, firstly, identif the identification of these uh, specific cases. Um, then the, um, in local visits, so uh, on-site surveys were very um, uh, specific and uh, uh, important. Sometimes it was also difficult to achieve these spaces because they are private or because they are in very uh, remote areas, so it's very, it's very difficult. Um, and in some cases I had to speak with local administrations, so both the municipalities but also the, the civil parishes or the parishes um, at all. I had, I had not uh, still talked with the um, with region, uh, not the cultural director of, um, <coughs> of, of Alentejo, not even the um, Patrimonio Cultural Portugal, that is director, general directorate of cultural heritage, uh, because I need to finish to collect this data and to show something, to understand what we can do together. Uh, with regard to the um, private owners, it's very complicated because most of them of the abandoned space are foreigners or owners, so are not Portuguese at all, uh, are not still there, are not there uh, at all. Um, so I had to collect information in different uh, ways. Um, what, what are the reactions of local communities? Sometimes strong because they have really uh, collected a lot of memories regarding that specific space. These comments have, they have been also tra transformed into uh, schools, uh, into um, hospitals. Uh, so uh, th there are a lot of people that have been connected to these spaces, uh, and they are a bit. Um, they are not so happy when they are transformed into five stars hotels, and it implies that they have not access anymore to the to spaces. Um, this is a, a very multi-layer uh, situation, but of course it needs to be dealt deeper uh, with each specific case. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, there is one in the middle there. Now I don't know what to do with the microphone. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a question any of you could, could answer. You, could you say who you are questioning? I could, Michael. yes. Give this microphone <laughs> to any of them, please. To any of them. Yes, yeah. any, any, of the, any of the speakers could answer this question because it's, it's generally. Uh, well, as we look to preserve uh, buildings, either churches or other, other buildings, we're beginning to blur the lines as uh, what the original purpose was. At what point, um, or who has priority, I think, how are, how are we going to allocate enough time? Say, you give the example of opening the building for a funeral, John, if you had an exhibition on for, say, a fortnight, who, who has the right to use the building in those cases? How do, how do the communities actually address these problems in the future? I don't really think that's a question on the EU level because, um, as I said earlier, the competence really rests with the member state and in this case with the regional or local authority. But I do know um, from my own personal experience, much as well as involved in drawing up guidelines, when you're considering reuse or repurposing a building, you really have to draw guidelines and a process and people should know what the process is. And within that then you can agree what happens in the situation that like you suggested about a funeral? And so much revolves around the community. I know that from even my work in the Commission. And it's all about a bottom-up approach, getting everybody involved, and try to get as much consensus as possible. Not easy, but it's worth a try. Do you want to anybody else would like to come in? I think it's a very good question you have. Um, and as I've been working on this project uh, with Lee, 
I've been thinking that when we're talking about heritage, it's sometimes not really a problem of the buildings or the physical things, but perhaps organizationally within the Church of Sweden, uh, perhaps it's time to rethink in terms of occupational categories. Who needs to be working here? What types of skills do we need in order to preserve heritage? It's not just a question of uh, the local community, it's important, but what about destination management, hospitality management, about realty, real, uh, realty development? Other types of skills which we don't traditionally link to the church, to mm -hmm. consultants, which could be drawn in, if not employed by the uh, Church of Sweden. But there are, uh, I the museums I'm working with, uh, they have changed dramatically. They've become businesses. They're not just cultural institutions anymore. And I think if we think of it in that terms, you start to see these buildings in very different light uh, and different possibilities. Okay, can I get the microphone?